Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, so I will uh, start my uh, presentation by uh, talking a little bit about what is a suburb um, in the Chinese context. Um, as you may know, most Chinese don't speak English in their everyday life, so we have different words for uh, describing what is uh, the periphery or outskirts or uh, here what you call a suburb. Um, so the bottom line is that um, China doesn't have suburbs. <laughs> uh, so suburb <laughs> doesn't exist um, in China as an independent administrative entity. So I will use uh, the city of Beijing as an example to um, elaborate uh, uh, what I mean by uh, suburb uh, doesn't exist. So, uh, so the map on the left is uh, a district map of Beijing. So the city of Beijing has uh, about, has 14 districts and then two counties. So for some of the outer districts, you can call them suburbs, but they are not, um, they don't have independent local governments. Um, they are district governments, but they are all under the jurisdiction of the municipal government of Beijing. So there's only one city government. And then uh, there are different districts. Um, there are also two rural counties. So, um, so in terms of uh, uh, the administration, suburbs uh, don't exist uh, because they don't have, uh, um, there, uh, there are no, um, they are not independent local governments. So here there are places you can call suburbs. Um, I live in Chicago, so for example, Evanston is a suburb, and Evanston uh, is also a city. It has its own city government. But in China, that uh, category doesn't uh, exist. So there are different districts, and they are all under the jurisdiction of uh, the Beijing municipal government. Um, and a few months ago, um, I was asked by um, uh, a geographer, Richard Harris. I believe he teaches here in Canada. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So he asked me to um, uh, write an essay about uh, the ways, different ways um, Chinese would call the periphery of suburbs. So I did a little bit of research. Um, so the, the letter uh, in red uh, is the Chinese word um, for suburb. So if we translate suburb into Chinese, um, the, the word is jiao qu, or jiao. Um, and the letter has two parts. So the left part, um, this one, it means uh, touches, intersect with, or crossing. Um, and the right part is um, the, uh, the one uh, on the left, um, on the right, so it means a market or government seat. So literally, the Chinese word for suburb means uh, the area of places that are very close to a city, but not in the city. So that's the original uh, meaning of uh, uh, the Chinese word um, for suburb, jiao qu. Um, so when I was writing the essay for Richard Harris, I did some research. Um, I also did a, um, a few interviews with the local residents in Beijing. Some are natives, some are migrants who just arrived uh, in the city. So, um, and I only have one question. I'm not an ethnographer. <laughs> so I asked people, um, so when you use the word jiao qu, the Chinese word for suburb, what do you mean by that? So I'm just uh, showing you one example. So this is a woman, um, she's a, a film producer. She's a local, uh, she was born and grew up in Beijing. So she uh, said that uh, Jiao Qu for me uh, doesn't mean how many kilometers away from Tiananmen Square. And Tiananmen Square is the geographic center of uh, Beijing. So she said, for example, Shun Yi. So Shun Yi is, um, uh, the neighborhood right next to the airport. It's very far. So by American standard, Canadian standard, it's a suburb. 
Uh, but according to her, she said Shunyi is very far, but I wouldn't call it Jiaoqi, a suburb, because it has ma many posh neighborhoods and upscale villas. Um, so Jiaoqi, suburb for me, means those really rural places. So the word Jiaoqi for ordinary Chinese residents is, um, it refers to the periphery, um, but it's not based on the distance. It's a marker of uh, development or lack of development. So for most people, even they live uh, very far from the city center, they don't want to admit that they live in a suburb because it's a negative, uh, it has a negative layer of uh, meaning. It means um, um, less developed uh, rural <coughs> places. So that's uh, the vernacular use of uh, Jiao Qu. Um, mm. And then I uh, read um, many uh, academic publications, papers, studying uh, suburbanization or suburban uh, sprawl in the Chinese context. So this is a quote from a very <coughs> senior uh, geographer based at Peking University. And this is how he understands what is a suburb. Uh, it's my translation. So he wrote, uh, research on suburbanization in China must adopt the approach of dividing cities being studied into the inner city, inner suburbs, and outer suburbs. So for Chinese urban geographers, um, and this is a very widely shared view that cities have to be divided um, into these three zones, the city, <coughs> inner suburbs, and outer suburbs. So uh, scholars can track the population change over time in these three zones. Um, so for the case of, case of Beijing, um, where is uh, the inner city? It's a tiny area uh, at the center. So there's a number, one, two, three, four. So that's um, the inner city. Um, and for inner suburbs, it's five, six, seven, eight. So these are inner suburbs, according to geographers. And then the rest of uh, the districts are categorized in the category, uh, in, in the group of uh, outer suburbs. Um, but if you ask a resident, for example, living even here in Shunyi, that's the airport suburb. So most people, uh, probably don't want to admit that <laughs> they, live, um, th they live in a suburb. But according to geographers, that's a suburb. That's a jiaoqu. So that's a very different um, understanding of um, uh, the meaning of uh, jiaoqu. Um, and the third example, uh, another different interpretation of what is a suburb, what is jiaoqu. So here, um, I uh, looked at uh, the urban master plans of Beijing from the 1950s to uh, uh, today, the most current version of uh, the master plan. So um, this is a map from 1957. That's the first uh, master plan after uh, the founding of uh, the country, PRC, People's Republic of China. So there are five uh, categories of jiaoqu. And this, um, this is the most common understanding back in the 50s of uh, what is a suburb. So uh, Jiaoqu was, uh, according to the 1957 uh, master plan, was basically uh, outskirt areas that should supply vegetables and meat for our urban residents. So that's how the communist government understood wh what is Jiaoqu in the in the 50s and 60s. Um, and this is the current, uh, the most recent uh, urban master plan. Um, so the change is that the word jiaoqu disappeared from the plans. So uh, for planners and government officials, they don't use the word jiaoqu anymore. And um, the word is replaced with new towns. So, um, so here, uh, the, this is the inner city, and all these smaller red dots are new towns. So in the past, they were called Jiaoqu, but Jiaoqu has a very negative meaning 
in Chinese. So now the word is dropped. So people use new towns, uh, urban planners, uh, government um, officials. They, um, they call these places uh, new towns. So there's a change in uh, the vocabulary terminology in the urban master plans. So, um, so that's, uh, uh, so that's uh, the, the Chinese context. Um, it's, um, as you can tell, it's very different from the situation here. So, um, so now I will talk a little bit about the second part of uh, the presentation, infrastructure. So I, again, I will use Beijing as an example uh, to talk a little bit about how the city has expanded um, at a very aggressive pace over the past 20 years. Um, so this is the Google map of Beijing, and the red circles are expressways. So the city has been expanding uh, very rapidly. Um, in the 19, mid 90s, uh, there were only three ring roads, and today there are seven ring roads. So this is the fifth ring road, and you can see from the map the seventh uh, ring road. It's already uh, built. Um, so Beijing uh, has uh, the second longest metro network in the country, and it's a very recent uh, phenomenon. Um, so Beijing had uh, the Olympics in 2008, and back in 2007, the city had only four lines, metro lines. And this is uh, the situation in 2001, so only two lines. Um, and this is the metro network uh, this year, 2015. So now the city has 18 different lines. Um, um, this is um, the, uh, the graph shows the increase, um, the expansion of uh, the metro network from 1990 to uh, 2001. So if you look at the graph, there, there are two turning points. The first one uh, is two around 2001. So that's the year when Beijing won, won the bid for the Olympics. So um, the Olympics basically gave the local government a green light for everything, uh, bu build uh, expressways, subway lines, and other uh, mega projects. Um, and the second turning point is around 2008. Um, so, so what happened in 2008? <laughs> Um, is the recession, um, the e economic recession. And the rule is, if there's a recession in the world, there's a boom in China. <laughs> it's always that way. So um, after, right after, um, I think in December 2008, um, the Chinese central government decided to um, have a stimulus plan to uh, help uh, local governments to uh, in invest in infrastructure. So Beijing received uh, a lot of funding from the central government, and they used much of the funding to build the subway system. So that explains the increase, the jump um, after uh, 2008. And here are some numbers. So between 2007 and 2015, uh, the city added almost 400, 378 kilometers. And these are not light rail. It's much more expensive. To, this is subways, so under, under the ground. So uh, the current capacity of uh, Beijing's metro, um, the length is more than 500 kilometers. Uh, the city has 18 lines and the daily ridership is more than 10 million passengers. So it's, um, it's a very busy uh, subway network. Um, and I talked about this. There are two turning points, the Beijing Olympics, uh, the economic recession, and the stimulus uh, plan. Um, and the city uh, announced uh, to uh, reach, uh, to build a thousand kilometers of uh, subway lines by uh, basically in five years, uh, by the year of 2020. Um, so, 
So it, uh, the construction has been very fast. And over the past two, three years, uh, the cost has become uh, um, quite high. Uh, the labor uh, is getting more expensive. Materials are uh, more expensive. And also, after 2009, uh, for land taken from residents or factories, enterprises, um, the, uh, the land taken for the subway construction had to be, uh, right, uh, has to be compensated compensated at the market rate. So um, the city also uh, needs to uh, spend uh, a lot of money on a land compensation, land acquisition. <coughs> so for the year of 2012, uh, the city basically uh, spent 10% of its revenue on uh, just on one, one project, the subway. Um, and Beijing is a very wealthy uh, city. Uh, it has a large, uh, very large, Revenue base, so 10% of uh, Beijing's revenue is. Um, is um, so this is a graph uh, of um, the revenue increase. So uh, the blue line is uh, the total revenue. Uh, it's in billion uh, RMB. Uh, one U.S. dollar is uh, six uh, more than six RMB. So you divide um, the number uh, by six. Uh, so there are two types of revenues. Um, the red line is based on tax, so it's basically GDP growth. The economy, the urban economy, the city's economy has been uh, doing very well. Um, so um, you see a steady uh, growth trajectory for our general revenues. And then the green line is uh, revenue um, uh, from land leasing. Uh, so. Um, so China doesn't have private land ownership. So the city can take land from different organizations, residents, and then sell land, uh, not sell, lease land to um, uh, developers. Um, so over time, the city has acquired um, um, a lot of revenues from uh, selling land. But if you look at the trajectory of the green line, it's uneven. So the land revenues are largely dependent on the real estate market. When the market is good, uh, the city can make a lot of money. When the market is down, so after 2011, so the land revenue has uh, declined. Um, so, uh, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the financing. Uh, there are different sources for um, um, financing uh, Beijing's subways. And the first and second land revenues and bank loans are the two major sources. So the city has been leasing out land. Also, um, the city has been borrowing money from uh, state banks. Um, so if the government uh, is the borrower, uh, normally almost 100% the banks are <coughs> very willing to um, uh, give uh, out, uh, out infrastructure loans. So there is also private-public uh, partnership, but it's very um, little. Uh, there's only one company from Hong Kong who, uh, which has invested in one of the 18 subway lines. So, um, so the big picture is that uh, the financing of the Beijing metro system is very uh, unsustainable. Uh, it's already 10% of the budget. It will only um, go up in the next few years. Um, so the Beijing subway is also very crowded. Um, if you are not in good physical shape, it can be dangerous to, <laughs> to try to <laughs> get in <laughs> a, a subway car during the rush hours. So uh, the congestion is, um, ha actually has very little to do with the um, uh, investment, the, there's over in five minutes. Uh, oh. uh, I already showed you the five. Oh, one minute. Okay, one okay. <laughs> so, um, so the congestion um, is mostly caused by uh, one single factor, which is housing prices. So, most Beijing residents can't afford uh, to buy anything in uh, um, in the center of the city, so they live outside uh, fifth ring, f the fifth uh, ring road. 
So every day, and the jobs are all in the city. So almost every working person in Beijing has to commute long distance to the city center. That's where uh, the jobs are. So very quickly, I'll show you a few images. Um, uh, the massive investment in the subway system uh, didn't improve uh, the city's um, congestion <laughs> situation, uh, didn't change uh, the situation at all. And also, um, one of the goals uh, of the city government um, uh, is to uh, reduce air pollution by investing in the public transit. But the air pollution is getting just worse and worse every year. Um, so, uh, um, um, and every month, uh, there are many new cars entering uh, the city roads. Uh, and Beijing has, um, let's see. This is, uh, Beijing has a lottery uh, system, so um, uh, if you are unlucky, you will never be able to drive your car because <laughs> <laughs> you can't get a license. And Shanghai is doing much better, uh, so Shanghai has an auction system, <laughs> so the highest bidders can get a, a license. And the price for a license plate in Shanghai today is more than 20,000 US dollars, so it's almost more expensive than uh, a basic car. Um, so what Shanghai is doing is, uh, so they raise funds from auctions, um, the auctioning of license plates, and then they use, use the money to build public transit. Um, so Shanghai is uh, uh, doing much better, uh, is much less con congested than uh, in Beijing. So quickly, just to summarize, uh, if you look at the subway example of Beijing, it's uh, it's, the picture is very clear. It's uh, not complicated. It's, um, um, it's an agent for a growth uh, state instrument to uh, expand, to uh, promote uh, property, promote uh, growth. Um, it has created <coughs> new centers and new margins. So if you are close to a subway station, then uh, you benefit from the rise of uh, uh, your property. And if you are not close, then uh, you lose uh, the value uh, of your property. Uh, in terms of uh, the financing, uh, it's not sustainable, and uh, uh, the effects on mobility, reducing congestion and reducing air pollution are very mixed. Um, and for the suburban part, as I already said, um, it's um, in non-Western contexts, uh, suburb is very problematic. It's confusing, it can be misleading. Um, so even for um, the local languages, um, for example, the word jiaoqu, there are so de many different meanings uh, in the word uh, jiaoqu. So, um, so I think um, perhaps periphery is a better term to uh, describe uh, the me metropolitan region beyond uh, the, the city, the inner city, or outskirts. So lastly, um, um, the last point, um, I think we shouldn't generalize about infrastructure conditions in cities in the global south. Um, we tend to use um, um, concepts such as informality or uh, insufficiency to uh, think about infrastructure uh, situations in uh, the developing countries. But China is a perfect example of a developing country with the one of the best uh, public transit uh, systems. It's not working very well yet, but um, um, it's a very different situation from Latin America, from India, from other uh, countries uh, in the Global South. So I'll stop here. Okay, we have about six minutes or seven minutes for questions. Yes, Pierre. Uh, great, great presentation. Uh, here, and I would like to see where the situation is in China. Here, one of the major problems with building public transit infrastructure is that the cost of building public transit over time has increased relative to goods and services within the economy. At the moment, to build about one kilometer of subway, of underground subway in Toronto is about $400 million, okay, so which, mm -hmm. which, which is enormous. At the beginning of the 20th century, private companies could build subways, operate them, 
and make a profit out of doing that. Now, you know, it's totally impossible. What is the situation in China? Is China the situation where building subways, public uh, building public transit is relatively cheap relative to you know other goods and services, or is the cost increasing? The cost has increased so much. So right now the situation is the local government can't afford to uh, build more subways. So the labor cost has uh, gone up, uh, materials, but the most uh, important factor is land. So before 2009, uh, the government could take land from different users, um, and the compensation was very little. But there's a law, uh, property rights law, passed in 2007, and in different places, it came into effect in 2009. So um, right now, uh, if people have to give up their housing or land for uh, municipal infrastructures, they have to be compensated at the market rate. So, um, so that explains uh, the rising cost. I have three questions okay. already on, so I think that we'll have to hold it to that, and maybe we'll put up, and that sure. be enough. So in the interest of gender parity, maybe we can go mm -hmm. first, and then JP, and then Roger. Mm -hmm. No, it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. But maybe we can collect the three questions. Yes, please. From uh, JP and Roger. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I was quite intrigued with your analysis of the term suburb in the Chinese context. And it kind of also um, reminded me uh, the answer that you gave, you know, your first answer of saying there's no suburb in, in China, uh, of the way that when we uh, started our research project on global suburbanism, and we're talking to our German colleagues, mm -hmm. and uh, we're trying to convince them in Leipzig in particular that they, they are actually suburbs, because they also make the claim that they don't have suburbs. Uh, because we all think about the North American uh, subdivision, single family, low density mm -hmm. image that we were fed by the media and, and, and the sitcom um, uh, things on TV. So uh, I, was, I was very surprised when I was with my students in Shanghai uh, just a few weeks ago. I also was part of this research project and, and people there did not have any problems with the term at all when we were talking about suburbs. And so your explanation is that they, they, they re re replace suburbs with new towns, which was also my experience. And mm -hmm. at the same time, when you talk about the rural area and uh, the definition of the 50s, where it was the agricultural-based uh, feeding, you know, the hint classical hinterland uh, mm -hmm. uh, connection. Um, so what, do you think that the, the term itself, uh, suburban or suburb, suburbanization in the Chinese context is a valuable concept or should we uh, re reframe it? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, but my, my question kind of leads on from this and the idea of what actually constitutes a suburban space mm -hmm. in, a, in the Chinese context. And the fact that you said people wouldn't want to admit that they were living in suburbs. So I was wondering if the development and construction of the metro system, which is typically understood as something which is an urbanizing piece of infrastructure, it brings the vanity and the centrality that you were mentioning mm -hmm. um, out beyond the central city. So has the actual development of the metro as a symbolic urbanization process impacted on the way that people will then identify with their position in these kind of peripheral landscapes to say, well, you know, we have uh, a metro station now, so we are actually urban, we are a new town in a way that presents mm -hmm. either um, disjunctures or new kind of synergies between the idea of what it is to be urban, suburban, mm -hmm. and its relationship with the infrastructure that's in place. Okay, thank you. Yeah, much the same. I just wanted to point out that when we had that infrastructure, uh, that uh, suburban workshop in Shanghai four mm -hmm. weeks ago, the first paper, one of the first papers said, I was asked by a guy called Richard Harris, who I believe is <laughs> in Canada. <laughs> uh, and that was uh, a colleague from Indonesia who was part of that project. 
Richard Harris is this, a central member of this team, and he's running this nomenclature project. It's following us, uh, us around because everywhere we go in the world, they tell us we don't exist. <laughs> so I'm going to defend this idea, um, and I'd say, but I said it very clearly, uh, implicitly already in my introduction. We're not talking about suburbs. That's we're talk That's a that's a term. Everybody has a different word. And I say I grew up in grew up in suburban Germany. I just said it to Jeff in the break. The people of the town in which I grew up, in the village that I grew up, would beat me up if I told them that I lived. I said that I grew up in the suburbs. This is the same everywhere in the world. This is a given. Nobody in the world, except for North America, uses that particular term, suburb. In German, it's Vorstadt, but. There are different Vorstadts for different uh, different circumstances. It's even different in Switzerland from Austria, from Germany, where you use that term. So what we are looking at, and that's I'm saying at the beginning of this two-day workshop, relative beginning, is that we're looking at suburbanization as a process. And those suburbs, inner, outer, those new towns in China clearly are part of a larger process of suburbanization in which new suburbanisms, new ways of life are beginning to take shape. So we're looking at that. And I, I was hoping that Richard would actually come by, and maybe I'll give him a call <laughs> to come here, because it's just down the road. Uh, he might actually come here tomorrow. I will try to get him here to hear this kind of conversation, because I think it's necessary to have a conversation. Ute said what we heard in four years ago in Germany. It was hilarious. And these are Germans who speak my language, and I couldn't convince them that what they had there were suburbs. They just said, no, actually, socialist city planning wanted to build cities, not suburbs. But what they built were actually suburbs. Stephen? Should I you quickly have to say respond? That? Well, I'll let <laughs> That's right. respond yeah. OK. So very quickly, um, I think there are similar urban processes going on in Chinese cities um, and uh, also in other places. Uh, so uh, if we use the word suburb uh, metaphorically, if we mean urban sprawl, then definitely uh, Beijing has been sprawling uh, very, at a very uh, intensive pace. Uh, but I do think uh, the language, the words we use um, does matter. And suburb is a very loaded uh, term. It has layers of meanings from uh, North America, from um, um, uh, the, uh, Europe. Um, so. Um, um, so the bottom line is, I think it, there is a need to pay attention to uh, the, the labels we use to um, um, call or frame uh, these processes and structures. And for your question, it's a very good question. I, I think over time, there is less resistance to, um, 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 to uh, living on the periphery because the infrastructure is getting better. Also, uh, today, if you look at big Chinese cities, almost everybody lives outside the central city. So there's less stigma and um, uh, resistance. And over time, I think in 20, 30 years, jobs will also migrate from the center to uh, different uh, activity centers. <laughs> so uh, there, there's definitely change um, um, happening. So thank you very much. Thank you.